Hi everyone, I, uh, I really hope you've been enjoying Local Hack Day. Uh, I'm going to give a quick talk about data visualization. Uh, data visualization is something I think is really cool. I think you can uh, take large sets of data and really show them off in meaningful ways. I think it's really great for uh, hacks that are aimed specifically for good. Uh, I think it'll provide insight uh, into a lot of things uh, that, that can uh, cause organizational change. And visualizations, I think, are just something that are cool. Um, so, just a heads up, I'm Shai Ruparel. If you want to follow me on Twitter, that's my handle right there. Um, and so the main tool I'm going to talk to, uh, to you about today is d3.js. D3 is a uh, data visualization framework or a document. Uh, it stands for Data Driven Documents. It's a framework written by Mike Bostuck, who works at the New York Times. Uh, he builds a whole bunch of really awesome data visualizations at the New York Times, which I highly encourage you to check out. It can really show how powerful D3 is when it's used properly. So what is D3? D3 is a declarative JavaScript visualization framework. So what does that mean? Uh, it, it means that D3 doesn't really work like uh, standard JavaScript does. And I'm going to go ahead and show that to you in a couple examples. Um, so let's do something simple. Let's do something fun. Uh, let's make a bar chart, a uh, quick and easy bar chart. So our data set is right here. We're going to graph uh, 4, 8, 15, 16, 23, and 42. So if I wanted to do this, um, there are two ways. I could, I could use D3 or I could do this manually. I could create divs, uh, set the widths, label on top of them. Uh, or I could load in the data dynamically, and, and that means we can do things uh, differently when it comes to updating that data. So before we get started, let's talk about how JavaScript lets you select an element. So in JavaScript, uh, you would create a div, a var div. Um, you would set the HTML, so the text of that div, uh, and then you would append it into the document um, with a document.body.append child div, uh, which would inject the, um, your new div into your body. D3 does this a little differently. Um, with D3, you're going to do a select. So you would do var body equals D3.select body, which finds the body and it sets it as a variable. So you'd be able to come back and use this later. You would then find the div, or you would create a div uh, by appending into the body. So now you have a variable that you can further update. And you would set the HTML as hello world, which lets you set the text uh, as hello world. So, and let's also talk about the steps that JavaScript takes for changing things. So if you wanted to change um, the color and the background color of a body in HTML, using JavaScript, using pure JavaScript is uh, three, three lines. And they're all three separate lines. You would select the body, uh, again using D3 in this instant. You would set the style and you would end the line. And then you would set the background color and then you would end the line. D3 uh, is really powerful and lets you kind of chain these methods together into one line, which allows you to uh, powerfully build and assign data to visualizations and impact on them almost immediately. So in D3, that would look like this. Uh, you would select the body. You would, instead of doing a semicolon, you would do dot style, which you could set the color. And then again, instead of doing a semicolon, you would do a dot background color. So, Let's go ahead and look at what a manual bar chart looks like. So I'm going to pull up a bar chart here. And this is a pretty standard bar chart. I have my CSS and my HTML. And it's, it's pure CSS and HTML. You can see there's no JavaScript here. Um, and so what I'm doing is the width of the JavaScript is being defined manually here. So if I want to go ahead and add an extra element, like I, I can't just put the number in. I have to type it in manually. And that makes keeping your that makes keeping your data, keeping track of your data, somewhat difficult. So I'm going to go ahead and write a new line uh, for a new element. I also have to remember like uh, what the size is. I have to keep it consistent myself. So 120 would be 12, I think, um, and then did. Uh, and hopefully this updates. It's a, so it would update. Um, it looks like I'm having some internet connections um, issues, but it would update and it would pop it in. But I'd have to write all of that data. Um, 
And if I, if I wanted to do something bigger than 420 pixels, so let's say I wanted to put 50, I would have to manually change the size down. Let's assume my web page, uh, my designer has given me size restrictions on my chart. So um, it's kind of difficult to keep track and to update, and it, it's not rendering live. It's, um, it's a static page. So D3 lets you do this dynamically. And D3 is pretty exciting about this. Uh, I really like how this is being done. So what D3 is doing is you load in your data, and so you can actually update your data as you need to. You would create a function. Um, in this case, the function is x. And what that does is it creates a scale. And so in that scale, you're setting a maximum size of 420 pixels. So when you call this function, it'll you'll give it the number, and it'll re resize your your uh, your chart length to make sure that the maximum is 420 and it'll keep in mind what the data set is because you load in the data set what the maximum of the data set is um, so it'll make sure everything is is pretty um, so you would do again this selection and if you if you note you see that it's all being chained so instead of this being individual lines it's all chaining together you would select the chart you would select every div um, you would go ahead and you would bind the data to that chart. You would join the chart uh, using this dot enter and dot append. Um, and then you would style it. So here we're doing a width. We're setting the width property of each bar um, as a function D. Uh, and so that's passing the data into this function. Uh, and in the function, we're getting return X, which calls our scale, which takes D and sizes it up appropriately so everything is consistent. And then afterwards, we set the text and it returns the appropriate bar. So let's give this a try. Hopefully this works. Ah, looks like because of my internet, it's not working. But it would resize the chart. And um, oh, there we go. So yeah, it's resized the chart. Um, and it's kept the 420 pixel boundary. And we can add um, as many things as we want. Um, so let's keep this in order. So 12. 50, 58, 93. So yeah, as we're doing this, it's keeping the, the chart updated. It's resizing as needed. There's uh, no difficult work to add this in. You just update your data set. And D3 has a lot of these really powerful tools that enable you to do stuff like this. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let's look at a couple uh, examples. So these, these charts, if you want to learn more about bar graphs, uh, there's a great tutorial that Mike Bostock has made, um, that, that link, uh, he goes through all of the uh, sp uh, finesse when it comes to bars, he talks about animations, and I really encourage you to check it out. But if you're curious, what else can you do with D3? There's a lot. D3 is a really powerful tool. You can use it for more than just charts uh, and bar graphs. It's, it's not just a charting framework, it's a document framework, so that allows it to be a lot more powerful. You can take any sort of data and create a visualization around it, including merge sorts. So in this instance, he's gone ahead and he's built, uh, they've built a merge sort and they visualize the position of the numbers in that data dynamically over time. So you can see here the data is um, being sorted. So you're able to take a look at the code. It's all open source. Again, you can use it for maps. Uh, so all of the zip code data has been imported into D3. D3 has a GeoJSON function, which allows you to um, allows you to convert uh, latitude and longitudes and other um, uh, location objects into specific visualizations. Uh, you can even make globes, and you can apply animations on those globes. This is just again importing GeoJSON of the world and then visualizing it and applying an animation to rotate it uh, on an SVG. Um, you can build all sorts of crazy graphs. Again, it's a data library first, and then a visualization framework second. Um, and there's all sorts of fun things. You can use uh, these cluster force layouts. I think they're really cool to show budgets. You can set the radius uh, equivalent to how much money has been spent and kind of keep track of things that way. Um, so if you're interested in some more of the things that you can do, I would check out uh, bl.ock s.org uh, and all of these are open source and you can take a look at the code and use that as a starting point for your project. Um, 
And then if you want to really dive, have a deep technical dive into D3, there's a Wikipedia or a wiki on the GitHub page that will go through all sorts of tutorials, um, really in-depth tutorials about uh, the library and the things you can do with it. So D3 is a really powerful framework that will enable you to do all sorts of visualizations uh, if you want to. And these are some great resources to look at if you're looking at uh, doing a hackathon project with it. It's definitely something that can, can be worked on over a weekend. So, thanks. I'm going to schedule the about this. Oh, are you coming on? Yep. Give me a moment. Okay. You're on. All right. So, thank you for that wonderful talk, Shai. Now, I got a couple of questions for you about D3. Okay. And then I want to have a discussion about front end tools. All right. All right. So, first off, uh, you showed us how to use D3 to manipulate the, the DOM like mm -hmm. in a style that, like jQuery, we yeah. can do, right? So when do you use jQuery? When do you like just need D three? Like where do you? Where's the like crossover between the two? So D three in my mind is really great for things like data loading. When I have a big data set and I need to work with that big data set, data set I'm always going to turn to D three. If you take a look at the local hackathon uh, day website, actually the graph that we or the table of uh, events that we load in and that map that we load in is all done through D three, and it's taking a CSV file and doing that all dynamically, so working with external data and placing it is really convenient. Uh, I would use jQuery if I didn't have a data set, if it was just a general, like if I was interacting with a database or if I was updating uh, a page or a visualization that wasn't being loaded externally, then I would definitely turn to jQuery. Interesting. So anything with data, you're going to turn to D3? I would then... personally turn to D3, yeah. Okay, interesting. So um, now I know that there are a million charting and graphing <laughs> yeah. and data visualization libraries out there in the world. Um, what sets D3 apart and like why are there so many competitors to it? Like obviously D3 seems to be the one that like sure. most professionals use, but uh, what, what's the deal? So I think, I think the thing that really makes D3 special, and this is kind of a misconception with the library, is that it's not a visualization library first. That's more of a, a consequence of what it actually is, which is a document library. It's in the name of the, of the framework, data-driven documents. It's all about dealing with your data and um, manipulating it in ways that uh, you can perform these things on, which just happens to result in visualizations as kind of a secondary consequence. But it's it's more of a mentality of I'm going to work with the data first, get the data how I need it in the place that I want, and then I'm going to visualize. Whereas I think most charting libraries are kind of restricted to being only able to do certain types of charts because they're dealing with the visualization as the end goal rather than how is the data coming in first. Interesting. But I mean, I feel like if you just surveyed like a random sample of developers on the street, they'd say that D3 is like the charting library. I, I definitely think it's a really powerful tool that lets you do like a lot of variety. So if you have a lot of variety and you only want to import one JavaScript file instead of multiple charting libraries for multiple different charts, D3 is the way to go. It's a, it's a lot lighter than importing a bar graph visualization and a pie graph visualization and a map visualization and a globe and you know, animations and all that separately. Sure, well, I totally agree with that. Yeah. But then, uh, so that brings me to a whole other point though, is like, okay, so clearly D3 is a really powerful tool. Like, yeah. I mean, we've seen all the examples of things you could do with it. Uh, I mean, you and I both know that D3 is not documented at all. No. Right? So number one, like, what does that mean for like novice developers or people who don't understand a library yet and want to use it? And then like, why is it not documented? It's been around for like ages at this point, right? So I think I think the best bet actually as a new developer is to go take a look at some of those examples. They're all open source and just play with them. See if you can inject your own data. One of my first hackathon projects at Rutgers was I took an existing map framework and I set it up to import my own data into it and then I walked forward from there when I had something working for myself. And I think uh, the amount of examples that exist uh, and the thoroughness of the D3 community and providing those examples in the code make it a really good starting point for um, a person to get going uh, and, and make like simple iterative steps um, with something that's already working. Uh, and that, I think, makes up a little for the, the lack of documentation. I think the documentation is getting better. Um, and it's, it's really, a, I think, a case of just making sure to ask for help if you're in an event to see if you're stuck. Um, and hopefully you can all walk, work through it together. Interesting. Um, yeah, I, I definitely have seen my fair share of uh, developers stumbling around documentation. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you were to ask me, I would say it's a pretty core uh, mm -hmm. part of any library, right? Yeah. Like, what a visualization or not. All right, let's talk a little bit about other uh, front-end tools that sure. people have used. Like, what are the common ones you see at hackathons? 
uh, obviously like D3 is like a home run hitter. Like that's yeah. a power player. Like, yeah. What else are you seeing out there? So I'm seeing a lot of um, actually just web, like general web frameworks, things like Angular I know is being used as a general front end tool now. Rails I think is more of a, more of a framework in general. Um, a lot of stuff like that, um, a lot of general JavaScript uh, extensions uh, to run front end. I think Angular is really the big one right now. I don't know, what, what do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, what have I, you been seeing? I've, I've certainly been seeing a fair share of Angular. I mean, like Bootstrap probably just needs to be mentioned, like obligatory, we have to mention it. Skeleton is another good one. Foundation yes. is another good one. I hate Foundation. <laughs> really? Like, dude, I did several migrations of Foundation to Bootstrap because yeah. it was like, I ran into issues just the way that mobile was, was rendered. And both times the commit message, the commit message was, may you never have to do this again <laughs> in your life. So those three are really cool in that they're really quick ways if you don't have design ability to like really kind of spruce up your project and make it look nice. Although the design of Bootstrap is very well known at this point. Like you know when you look at a Bootstrap that it's a Bootstrap website. But Sure, that's completely fair. Um, yeah, I definitely think that there's like a ton of tools out there that people have been using. Mm -hmm. I mean, other... Like things I've been been noticing, there's like a flat design theme yeah. a lot of people have been using. That's uh, in the new version of Bootstrap. Yeah, I so. saw that. And there's also like a, another one too. Um, I mean, I've, I've actually seen, uh, honestly, like I've seen more applications of the jQuery like API and framework that yeah. I, I even thought were possible at some, some point, yeah. right? Like, uh, I certainly see a lot of that. Um, yeah, I think that the, it's an interesting landscape though. I think that like basically you can categorize it as like design frameworks. Mm -hmm. Utility tools, like maybe, like, I mean, I don't know if you remember when underscore was around, but like, I, I actually still use underscore. I, I like combining underscore with D3 because you can use underscore to kind of parse through your data very efficiently. And yeah, I feel like a lot of the stuff that's in underscore is now like built into yeah. like underscore six, so it's like, eh, kind of <laughs> okay without it. Anyway, yeah, I, I certainly see a use for software functions there still. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, utility, and then the final one would be like visualization or like mm -hmm. graphing. I think D3 actually straddles the line between like utility function, yeah. which is what it's supposed to be, yeah. but most people use it for visualization. Yeah, I think there's definitely some misconceptions with how D3 works and how D3 is being used. And definitely uh, Mike's tutorials and Mike's resources are, are the best bet for really understanding why it is that it works. Interesting.